I don't know about you folks, but somebody who has not been on this channel until today is an appraiser. Not only do we have an appraiser, but we have an appraiser who is financially free. So I want to see if there's some kind of connection between being an appraiser and earning financial freedom. Let's welcome Josiah Smelser to the show. How are you doing, Josiah? Hey, man, I'm awesome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Oh, yeah, it should be fun. Well, do me a favor, introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you? What are all the things that you do? And we'll get into your story. Yeah, so uh, Josiah Smelser, I am currently living in North Alabama, uh, not far from Huntsville in Florence, Alabama. Uh, I have been investing in real estate intentionally for about seven years. However, I started investing in real estate back in 2005 oh. without really a, knowing what I was doing or a purpose. When I got serious about it in 2017, uh, a business partner and I set out to try to reach financial independence through real estate investing. And we used the Burr strategy mm. to buy distressed properties get those fixed up, get those rented out, refinance and repurpose our capital. And we did that in Fort Worth, Texas, hmm. because I used to live in Fort Worth, Texas, and that's where I became an appraiser. And so we can get into how appraisal has affected that financial independence journey for me, but it really, it gave me the reps in the trenches to get out and learn the neighborhoods learn how to calculate the numbers on a deal and, and be able to spot a good deal. And so long story short, that's me. Uh, I run a real estate investing podcast as well, but I just, I just wanted to say this. I just had Michael on my podcast episode and uh, that's about to come out. I'd love for you guys to come over and check that out as well on my channel, which is my name, Josiah Smelser. Find that on YouTube. There you go. Well, let's go back to that, uh, that, 2005 experience. I'm always interested in the beginning is before you got serious, no doubt. Uh, was that a, was that a house purchase, a duplex? What was, what, what happened in 05? Yeah. So 05, I graduated from undergrad in 04 and I had a degree in accounting mm. and I okay. took that job at a big four accounting firm in Fort Worth, Texas. And they did the traditional work in me <laughs> like a dog burning me out. I, I was some weeks working 95 hours a week and Oof. I was in a cubicle traveling all over the place. I was just exhausted. And uh, I was like, yeah. this is not what I want to do long-term. So I left that job after about a year, uh, went over and, and uh, dedicated some time to helping others, did some work in an orphanage in Rwanda oh while goodness. I was in Africa. Yeah. While I was in Africa, I got a message from a good friend that said he was leaving his boss and starting his own appraisal business, he asked if uh, if I could be the first person to join him. But so said, yeah, I love real estate. I want to get into that. So my first property in 2005 was buying a house hack, and okay. that was that was buying my home, renting out rooms in my house to my friends, and I I had a four bedroom, so I rented three bedrooms out. I was that completely covered my mortgage, and we split the uh, utilities, so uh, I had basically no housing costs. Took wow. that money and then went and did some flips. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. Back then, there was no bigger pockets. Yeah. I, at least if there was, I didn't know about it. I don't think it existed back then. But mm -hmm. that's how I, I got my feet wet in real estate. And it was both investments went really well, that house hack and then the flip that I did. And I was like, wow, I need to do more of this. Some is good, more is better. <laughs> that <Yeah>. simple strategy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, that's, that's cool. So I'm curious, always curious what happened to that first, do you still own that first house or did you sell it at some point? 1031, what happened to that first house? Yeah. So late 2007, early 2008, uh, right as the housing market was starting to really melt down, uh, I had sold my flip and I had made, I think I made $30,000 on that flip. That was my first flip. And I just had my home. Uh, I had renovated my home, kind of done a live in, yeah, Burr strategy deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had significant equity there. So I wanted to go hike the Appalachian trail. I wasn't married. Um, I sold my house and I took all that equity paid off every penny of debt that I had and I had a good bit of money in savings and I went and hiked the Appalachian trail. So I missed all the real estate carnage that went on in 2008. Cause I was on the Appalachian trail hiking. So it went, I, it went well for me, so but did, I, did you complete it? Like start to finish the whole trail? I, I went Georgia to Pennsylvania in three and a half months. Wow. And, uh, the guy that was with me on the trail, he was a college buddy. He ran completely out of money and I was starting to run low on money. 
Uh, and of course we didn't have an income. We were just yeah. spending money on eating and, and, you know, it's expensive. You're eating a lot of food when you're hiking the trail. And I was doing the math and I'm like, by the time I get to Maine, I'll be in, I'll have credit card debt. And that's like a personal thing of mine is like, I don't do credit card debt. Yeah. So I was like, we need to get off the, we're going to get off the trail. I got off the trail and went back to work. So, ah, there you go, man. You've yeah. had some, ex we're only in 2007 or eight at this point. You've been in Yawanda. <laughs> You've been working yeah. 95 hours at this. You're hiking a trail. Yeah. Your story is crazy. So, okay. <laughs> now, now you, uh, you come back, you're working with a buddy. You're, you're an appraiser. You, it sounds like you spend a decade, maybe. Yeah. Let's call it a decade kind of getting reps. Um, and then you get back to getting serious about buying distressed properties and doing the burst strategy. So uh, yeah. Talk about that, you know, cause that, you know, a decade of appraisals, that's, a, that's a lot of reps I'm guessing. Yes. And I, you know, when I got off the trail, I went to grad school, I got my MBA. I was always being pulled at by the corporate world because I had the accounting degree and I, you know, I have decent financial head on my shoulders. So I, th these jobs were there and they pay you well. And when you're not running your own business, you know, you're looking for just a way to pay the bills. So I worked at some different corporate jobs, still had that appraisal license, would, would also do appraisals on the side for myself, just under my own business name and um got married in the meantime one in in 2017 uh, a good friend uh came to me and said hey i had a really good year in sales i've got two hundred thousand dollars i want to get into real estate he said i don't really feel confident in what i'm doing enough to go do it by myself what are your thoughts and i said well i feel like i've got the knowledge i've done a few properties i've got the appraisal knowledge I'm also a licensed uh, agent. And I was like, I think I could help you find the deals and I could help you get the deals renovated and maybe we should team up, you know? And so what we did is we teamed up and we did a 50, 50 partnership. He put the capital in, I did everything else. Got and it. my deal with him was I'll, I'll get the deals. We'll get them renovated. We'll get them rented out. We'll get them refinanced. I'll handle everything on the, the contractors, finding the deals, the financing, all that. You just need to go in there and sign the documents. Mm -hmm. And so, I like and then it. I said, I'll, I'll pay you back every penny you've put in before I ever get a penny of profit. And so that's what we did. And we built our portfolio from 2017 on just on Burr, Burr strategy properties in Fort Worth, Texas. These were like B class properties. The average deal we'd get into for like 150. By the time we were done with it, we'd be all in for 200 and they would rent cash flow positive, you know, $200 a door on average, some a little more, some a little less. But in 2021, when the market went crazy, we sold all that stuff mm. and we did 1031 exchanges in, into vacation rental cabins in the Smokies. And that really unlocked the portfolio profit. And that got me to financial independence because of that higher cash flow on those vacation rentals. So now we have a portfolio of vacation rental cabins in the Smokies. And then I've got some vacation rentals on a lake here in Alabama as well. Very cool. So at this point, do you still have a partner or are those yours? I do. I still have a business partner. Yep. Okay. Okay. And so we, you guys did are we did 1031s. Mm -hmm. We sold in 21 just to avoid all the taxation. We did 1031s oh. and and he and I were partnership partners on all of it with our LLCs. We just moved it all into vacation rentals. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So at this point, he's been paid back in full, no doubt. That way, all the profit now is truly 50-50 uh, yes. between you two. Yeah, I left that part out. We along the way, I picked up a vacation rental deal on my own, and that property just went crazy on value. I held it for about a year, and then I sold that. I made a good profit on that, so I turned around and took my, I took two hundred k, put that in the business, matched his two hundred k, and okay. then we're right now the portfolio is kicking off about six hundred thousand a year in profit, net of everything. So six hundred thousand a year. That's fifty grand a month. No, yeah. 50 grand a month, roughly. No, let's see. Uh, what is that? Um, yeah, 50 grand a month. Yeah. Wow. And then you guys, you split that roughly. You yes, that's that split between wow. the two of us. So 300 a piece. There you go. Well, that's certainly not. How many, how many cabins are we talking about? That's because yeah. if that's 600 a net, I mean, the gross has got to be like one four or something. The gross on these things this last year was, was approaching 1.9 million. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. There you yeah, go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got six cabins in the Smokies in the business. 
Mm-hmm. And then we've got seven cabins and little, uh, there's three cabins and four little houses on the lake in Alabama. So, so that's thir- is that 13 doors? Is that how we count that? That's 13 doors. However, the doors are a little deceiving when it comes to vacation rentals. And this okay. is the reason some of these cabins in the Smokies are 12 bedrooms, you know? Oh my God. Bedroom, and they can sleep 55 people. So these are, <laughs> These are, yeah, like the last cabin we bought, we paid, it was an 11 bedroom and we paid about 2.2 million for it. And, um, on average, and of course we were buying these when rates were around 4%. So most of our stuff is, most of our stuff is locked on 30 year fixed 4% interest on these deals. And, um, the last one we purchased was about $200,000 a bedroom. And on average, we make about $10,000 a bedroom per year on that. So that 11 bedroom is making us about 110,000 a year. Got it. Wow. I'm just trying to do some math. So you have 1.9 million gross Yep. divided by, so again, it's just using 13. So that's 146 K per cabin. But again, some of the cabins are 11 bedrooms. So that makes sense. So then you divide that. What, What do you think the occupancy is? You know, we've looked at that year? and of course it, it, it fluctuates, but I would say, I would say we're between 80 and 85%. Okay. So, you know, we have a, a pricing, a dynamic pricing tool that we use, which, you know, takes a lot of the pain of getting in there and messing with everything daily yourself. You can imagine if you've got 13 of these things that yeah. could, that could become a real headache. So this dynamic pricing tool will, will adjust your rates based on the sure. market occupancy and then you know how booked up you are on your properties and stuff so so you're roughly speaking between 450 and 500 a night if you were to average across the i would portfolio. say i would say somewhere around that when you when you factor in uh now with gross revenue you're factoring in the cleaning fees sure. as well. oh that's true that's that gross that. revenue okay. is the cost of the to the night rent and all the fees okay Ex- exactly and then down below on our expenses the the, the cleaning fees are coming back out of but course. we do the the good thing about the cleaning is we do make a little bit of profit on the cleaning as well. Yeah, cost plus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Total sense. Yeah, well, that's that's just amazing. It, I I had no idea. First off, I didn't know eleven bedroom houses existed. I'm not even sure where the <laughs> Smoky Mountains are. So shame yeah. on me. <laughs> so it's on the East Coast, I'm guessing. Um, no, it's in Tennessee. In Tennessee, Tennessee Gatlinburg, oh, Pigeon Tennessee. Forge, Tennessee. Yep. I had no idea. You got the Great uh, Smoky Mountain National Park there. There's millions of vacationers that go there a year. So it's it's a very highly traveled vacation spot. And that's why this works. When people go to yeah. the Smoky Mountains, they want to stay in a cabin, right? The yeah. hotels aren't as appealing. Right. So they go, they want to get a cabin and they take two or three families or more. They yeah. all pile in there together and split the cost. There you go. Makes total yeah. sense. Makes total What is the average stay? Are we, I mean, are we, is an average booking seven days, 10 days? I have no idea. I'm just curious. Yeah. Great question. So on the smaller ones, what we've noticed, like we have the smallest one we own is four bedrooms. On okay. the four bedrooms, we get more two night stays. Mm-hmm. On the larger cabins, they're more more likely to be like five nights to a week. Okay. Because in the larger cabins, they tend to book out further in advance. And so when sure. you're thinking a 12 bedroom cabin sleeps 55, you've got multiple families or like- <laughs> That's a lot of planning. Teams, yeah, athletic teams or churches or whatever. And yeah. they're, they're wanting to book this thing three to six months in advance. And so- yeah, they, they, they're a little bit different animal when it comes to the size of these things. No, I got you. I got you. Now, it'd be very interesting. You got in at the right time. Clearly, you've moved some equity around. Clearly, smart move. You got 30-year fixed rate debt, so you don't have any pricing pressure. But I don't think it's unfair to say that uh, Airbnb, these vacation rentals got overhyped. People were selling it as get rich quick, and it's not. Real estate's never easy. You probably saw a lot of people come in and start overpaying in 22 and 23. I'm going to guess there's probably a lot of people hurting that simply bought wrong or had unrealistic expectations. Is that fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but again, this is just part of the process, right? The fools rush in, the chairs aren't there. They overpay, they lose, they get out. And then the, the cycle continues. Is kind of what you're seeing? Yes. The, I think the mistake that a lot of people make on the vacation rentals um, from my perspective is that they go in there and they overpay on the front end and then they go and hire a property manager. 
And the mm. property management companies, a lot of these guys charge 20, 30%. So there wow. goes all your profit. So a yeah. lot of these properties that are struggling are, you know, out of state owners that have hired a third party management company and the third party management company, like Vacasa is an example. Vacasa is in financial trouble right now. Mm. Um, and they, you know, I'm not speaking directly to Vacasa, but there's a lot of these third party management companies that haven't done a good job. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kid McElroy is talking about uh, yeah. uh, across the board, not only vacation rentals, but just multifamily owners. A lot yeah. of these uh, syndications came out about they were financial engineers with bad assumptions that created a property management arm, and they've never been through a rough cycle, and they're going they're going belly up. So uh, yes. it wouldn't shock me if that happened in other parts of real estate. So yes. I'm curious, you went from doing a flip to a burr to vacation rentals. The market's clearly different today than it was in 2020 or 2018. Where, where do you, where do you go next? Are you going to add more? Are you happy? What, what, where, where do you go next? So on my uh, interview with you yesterday, you mentioned seller financing. So I've done a deal this year, seller financing. It was really interesting. It was a, a guy I was friends with. He had purchased a property. He was dealing with a lot of repair issues and some unforeseen expenses and he was getting worn out. So he brought that deal to me and said, Hey, I'm frustrated and just ready to get rid of this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, you know, he was wanting me to list it for him. I'm a licensed broker up there. And I said, I'm just going to be honest with you. Interest rates have gone up since you purchased this. You know, you don't have the financials to show somebody uh, really strong financials over the last year because of what you've been dealing with. So you're going to take a discount on what you paid. And it's looking like he was going to lose most, if not all of his equity, which was, you know, nearly 200,000 bucks. Oof. And so Ouch. he said, well, do you want it? I said, I, I ran the numbers and I'm like, it doesn't make any sense for me to take this. It'll be cash flow negative unless we do your equity at 0%. There you uh, go. And he said, I'm, I'm fine with that. He said, he gave me a 10 year 0% on his equity. And I just assumed his financing where it was. And, um, so I'm, I'm doing stuff like that when it, you know, surfaces, of course, those deals are not everywhere, but if the deal makes sense and pencils and it's cash flow positive for me now, uh, and we just kind of stuck it in there with the rest of our stuff and, and it's, it's, it's working well, but, but you know, big picture, what, the, what is the next thing? That's what I've been really working on. And I think the key in real estate is as you build equity, paying attention to your return on equity, not just your cash on cash of your initial investment. But as you build equity, you got to pay attention to what that's returning you. And we unlock that equity from the single families into the, the vacation rentals. That's gone way up. The next really good, hot real estate market we're in, I think we're probably going to sell the vacation rentals and unlock the equity that's been created there and move that into commercial somewhere. somewhere. Okay. All right. So you're going to continue the 1031 uh, game, just go bigger, kind of... Uh what Ken McElroy has done over his career and lots of, frankly, lots of very large players is they just, they keep 1031 ing as, as cycles move, they take the equity from one, move to the other, ride that way. Recycle. I think that's the plan. And I would like to do it as a, I would like to sell it as a portfolio if I can, mm. that mm. way uh, we don't have 13, 1031s. <laughs> to, yeah. You know, yeah. That'd you know. be interesting. Uh, I yeah. would guess, again, this is just, in real time reaction, you're going to probably, you would probably be forced to take a discount. Yeah. That's what I'm uh, expecting. Okay. I am expecting that, but you know, I think the sweet spot in real estate is where you're working on your business and not in your business. Right. Agreed. And the vacation rental business, don't get it twisted people out there. It's a lot of work. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. The IRS with... tells you it is. The yeah. IRS says it's hospitality. That's right. And it is hospitality. And you know, when you have, one cabin that sleeps 55 and then you've got 13 cabins, you're running a big hospitality business it takes a lot of time. And yeah. so there's that piece of the business. So if we could maybe discount our whole, whole portfolio a little bit, sell it all at once to somebody who wants to get into the vacation rental game, we take that and go put it in an apartment deal. And it's in one asset that we can hire professional management to manage. Yeah. Then I can focus on, you know, building my business over on my YouTube channel and, and let that kind of be professionally managed and, and keep my real estate and the tax benefits that go along with the depreciation and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that'd be really, really cool. Well, you've also authored a book. I always like it when people author books and know how hard it is. You want to want to tell us about it? What is it? Where can we find yeah. it? Yeah, 
here's the book. It's it's titled Dream It and Build It, How to Crush Your Real Estate Investing Goals. And I felt like there were a lot of books out there on the nuts and bolts of how to tell if a property will cash flow, that kind of thing. But I was reading the book Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield and also Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And those are two of my favorite books. And when I wrote this book, I wrote it in that same format where it's like, I was documenting the process of building my real estate business and reaching financial independence. And I wanted to document the, the, the thought process that goes into building your business in real estate. And that's what it is. So it's not a book of formulas. It's more a book of how to think as you're building your real estate business. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a new experience writing a book. I'm really proud of it, but you can find it on Amazon. It's on Kindle physical and you get the Kindle version are there. And then I'm working on getting the audible version out as well. Very, very cool. It's a lot of fun. Well, thank you for being this. It was a fun being on your channel. One more time. What is your YouTube channel? So my YouTube channel is just my name. So if you look at my name right there, it's just Josiah Smelser at Josiah Smelser. And that channel is on making smart money decisions, reaching financial independence so you can get unstuck and do work that you love to make a positive impact in the world. I love there's it. more, Thanks, there's Josiah. more to life than just getting rich. It's not about just getting rich. It's about living a life of purpose. And that's, there that's what my channel is about, but yeah, you thank go. you so much for having me, man. I love your show. It's been awesome meeting you. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you, buddy.